Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm Stephen, your host for today, and I'm speaking with Professor Nicole Hallett, an Associate Clinical Professor of Law and the Director of the Immigrants' Rights Clinic. Professor Hallett holds a JD from Yale Law School and a Master's in Refugee Studies from the University of Oxford. She has taught at the New York University School of Law, Yale Law School, and the University at Buffalo School of Law, and has also worked as an attorney with the Urban Justice Center. Professor Hallett is here today to talk to us about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. Professor Hallett, it's great to have you on. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'm so glad you could join us. And um, we have a lot to get to today. So I'll start off uh, with just a, a question about, you know, so your, your work in general. Can you give us a, a quick overview of, of your path starting in your college years um, to, you know, what led you to UChicago? And briefly, you know, could you explain uh, to someone who <laughs> does not have expertise in your field uh, what it is that, that you do on, on a daily basis? Sure. Well, I'll start with what I do and then I'll, I'll work sure. backwards. So right now I am an associate clinical professor of law at the University of Chicago Law School, and I direct the Immigrants' Rights Clinic here. And what a clinical professor does in the law school context is that we teach the experiential part of the curriculum for, for all law students. Uh, and we have a practicing public interest law firm that is located in the law school. And we have clients that our students uh, help us represent. And we are also professors. So I teach in the classroom. I also teach uh, the fieldwork portion of the clinic. And so really what I'm doing is I'm working at the intersection of legal practice and academia. So that's what I do right now. Uh, in terms of how I got here, I guess I would say that this is not a job that I that I knew when I exited the womb that I, that I wanted to do. In fact, I had very little awareness that this job even existed. When I was in college, I was a philosophy and English literature major and was very interested in going into academia. My parents are both professors, so it was something that I was very familiar with. I was not so familiar with with the legal profession. Uh, it, you know, I didn't have any lawyers in my family. It wasn't something that was really discussed when I was growing up. But when I was in college, I began to try to figure out what I wanted to do afterwards. And while I really enjoyed the intellectual pursuit of knowledge and, and scholarship, I, I found myself wanting to do something perhaps a little bit more practical that could also really make an impact in the world. And that's basically why I decided to go to law school, because it seemed like I was able to pursue my intellectual interests, but also gain some real life skills that would allow me to to give back. When I got to law school, again, I had I didn't know what law school was about. I didn't know the clinical professors existed. But essentially, as soon as I knew that the position of cl clinical professor existed, I knew that it was the job for me. It was it was everything that I wanted in one. It allowed me to focus on the, the scholarship that I wanted to focus on, but it also allowed me to have an active legal practice and really focus on teaching other uh, others, law students and fellows and others, how to practice law. And so it really combined all of the different things that I wanted to do. Now, you cannot become a clinical professor right after law school. You have to get some legal experience before you can go back into academia. So I did practice law for about five years before I went back into academia as a clinical professor. Um, but I would say that during that entire period of time, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And I was trying to kind of tick the boxes that I needed to tick in order to get the job that I wanted. Um, so I did not know what I wanted to do in college. I was I was very unsure. But by the time I got to law school, I had a I had a better idea. OK, cool. And uh, yeah, I mean, I will get into the the details of the work that you uh, are doing and, and have been doing in a little bit. But I want to jump uh, way back right now <laughs> to when you were uh, much younger, maybe in like middle or high school, um, I mean, were there other things that you saw yourself doing? What, what did you want to do at that age? Well, from a very early age, I thought I wanted to be a writer, um, a fiction writer, actually. And I, I was one of these kids that was writing novels when they were six or seven years old. And so for most of my childhood, including up through 
middle school and high school, that is sort of what I thought I was going to do. I didn't end up doing that, although I think that that my work now requires me to tell stories uh, and it, it requires me to teach others how to tell stories. So I see myself as a storyteller now, even though I'm not writing novels. The reason I didn't uh, go into, you know, creative writing and uh, really pursue a career in fiction uh, I remember I was, you know, 17 or 18 years old and I had been working on multiple novels when I was a, a teenager and I really had to make a decision about what I was going to major in in college. And I remember having this feeling that I, I hadn't lived enough life to really be able to write fiction effectively. It was something I sort of discovered over the course of my childhood that that I, I really needed to live life uh, before I wrote about it. And of course, people can have different ideas about whether that's in fact true. And there are many novelists who are prodigies at a very early age. But for me, that's how I felt. Uh, so when I got to college, I, I knew that I might want to pursue that eventually, but I didn't want to pursue it right away. I wanted to go get my, my college degree in something else. And I have to say that I haven't gone back to that, um, but I use a lot of those skills in my in, in my job today. It's it's actually something that I might want to get back to eventually. I certainly feel like I've lived enough life that I have some insightful things to say uh, that I don't didn't necessarily feel like I did when I was uh, eighteen. But I you know I think the 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 passion for writing and persuasively telling a story is really the through line that that takes me into my job today. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And uh, I'm sure that your experiences, uh, that, that there are some, some great stories that could come from those now. But yeah, it, it's interesting that, you know, you said storytelling is a part of, of your job. And um, I, you know, I, if I'm reading you correctly, that's that's because you actually are uh, practicing as you teach. So yeah, can you tell me, like, how, how did you narrow in on that? Like, at what point did you know that you wanted to... Uh, be a, a clinical professor and, and do that work? So, you know, again, I didn't know anything about being a clinical professor before I got into law school, but I had the experience of taking a clinic when I was in law school, and it was one of the most formative experiences of my life. It, it literally was transformative. I found purpose. I felt like for the first time in my life, I had something to contribute, which was that I had this legal knowledge that I was able to use to help other people. And what I loved about the clinic was, was not only that I was able to learn so much and, and contribute so much, but I saw my clinical professor who not only was doing the amazing work that I was doing as a student, but he was also amplifying the effect he could have because he was teaching all of us who then go out, it would go out into the world and become practicing lawyers ourselves. And so it seemed like a way to do the work I wanted to do. And at the same time, I wouldn't just be doing the work for myself. I would be teaching law students how to do the work. And I hope, and I think based on what they've told me that my law students find it a transformational experience as well. Um, so it was really taking a clinic in law school that led me to decide that I wanted to teach a law clinic eventually. Um, and like I said, it took a while to get there, but that I knew at that point that it was my ultimate goal. That's really cool. Can you tell me more about this, this first clinic that you were a part of in college and then the kind of work that you did as a student? Yeah, actually, the work that I did in in the clinic in in law school was um, what was is very similar to the work that I do today. So uh, you haven't asked about why I'm focused on immigration law, um, but I'll I'll tell part of that story now because it's it's related to this. So I had um, I had come into law school after having done a, a master's degree at the University of Oxford in refugee studies. Uh, and so I had this sort of pre-existing interest in immigration, um, which actually arose not in college, but the year I spent after college in South Korea on a loose scholarship, uh, which is a postgraduate scholarship for people to spend a year in Asia um, working in their various fields. And so I came into law school really interested in migration studies, refugee studies, but really thinking, I, I, I was really interested in it from a policy level, thinking through the international refugee system and how we could improve it and, and sort of the, the ways in which it had failed over the years. 
And I am still very interested in that. What the clinic really did, though, was it allowed me to take what I had learned about migration and about forced migration and look at how that actually operated in an individual case. So that first case that I was able to work on my first year of law school was the case of a woman from Kenya who uh, was claiming asylum because she did not want to be um, subjected to forced genital mutilation. And we won that case. And uh, she's uh, still a, a close friend of mine. And I, I watched her thrive in the United States and, and have a family and, get, and have a career. But at the time, she was really at a crossroads. She was terrified of going back. And, and, and she needed me to represent her. And the empowerment that I felt in, in being able to do that successfully was, to me, more gratifying than any of the policy work that I had done. Because at the end of the day, policy work is about people. But it's very easy to forget that. It's very easy to sort of abstract it out. And so you're just kind of thinking about principles and, and structures. And again, I still do a lot of that work. But for me, that connection to individuals was essential. And I knew that I wanted that to be part of what I did in my career. I, I didn't just want to be thinking about these issues. I wanted to be acting on them and, and really trying to figure out how to improve individuals' lives. And I have to say that um, while I do spend a lot of my time representing individuals with my students, I feel like that experience of representing individuals informs how I think about those systemic or structural issues in a way that I'm not sure that I would really get if, uh, if I wasn't um, also doing that individual client work. Yeah, I you know that that was actually one of our uh, questions later on the list, um, and you already sort of answered it. But uh, could you tell me a little bit more about the master's degree and then your time in Korea? Um, like, how do you think that that, apart from the very concrete, you know, sort of the knowledge that you gained, um, how do you think that affected your uh, trajectory? So when I was in South Korea, that was really the first time that I had even thought about migration issues, and I think the reason for that is is mostly based on my my upbringing. So I uh, grew up in um, a small town in, in Indiana. I, I definitely um, had lots of classmates from different parts of the world, mostly people who had come to my town, you know, because they had a connection with the university. So, what, so it wasn't um, exactly like you might imagine a kind of a Southern Indiana childhood to be. <laughs> but the issues were, that, that, that arise around migration, forced migration, they were issues that were basically invisible to me. It wasn't something that was discussed. You know, I have, my family has been in the United States for, for many generations. It was not part of our family story. And when I would have friends that were from other places, it was, it was really just sort of matter of fact, here's where this person is from. I didn't think about it. I think that probably part of that is the culture of the place. A part of it is perhaps that someone else in my position might have been more interested in it, but certainly that, that was not really a large part of, of my upbringing. I knew I, wa I was interested in international issues, and that's really the way that I came to migration as, as a topic that I was really interested in. I went to South Korea after I uh, graduated from college, and actually, the thing that happened in Korea that really set me on uh, the path towards becoming a, um, a, an immigration law professor is the, the experience that I had in Korea as, uh, as someone who was an outsider, as someone who did not speak the language fluently. The program that I was on did give us um, some language training before we left, but I was nowhere near fluent. <laughs> and Korea is a fairly homogenous place. And while I, you know, it, it, it's not exactly the same, I, I actually, for the first time, experienced how it feels to be someone coming to a new place and trying to make a life there. And, I, and it was really difficult. I mean, it was the hardest year of my life, just getting a cell phone or get opening a bank account or just buying groceries. All of those things were very difficult. And 
it occurred to me that I was someone who had a college degree. I had lots of resources. I was white uh, in a country that, uh, you know, didn't, that had, you know, positive views of, of, of mm -hmm. white people. And even despite all of those advantages, it was the hardest year of my life. And when I came back, uh, suddenly the, the issues that immigrants faced in the United States became visible to me in a way that they weren't before. And at that point, although I, I knew that I was going to go to law school eventually at that point, at that point, I really became more invested in migration and forced migration in the United States than I had been before. So it really came full circle. I was sort of interested in international issues, but those international issues really brought me back to the United States and allowed me to look inward at my own country to see how immigrants were treated here. And that's what really set me on my path to going to law school and having as a focus going in that I wanted to focus on immigration. Cool. Thank you. Um... So, yeah, you know, I, I want to look a little bit at just sort of your uh, your experience teaching and, and you know, what, what your life is like. And uh, first, uh, yeah, could, could you just describe a little bit about, uh, I don't know if there's a, a typical day, but, you know, like what what gets you up in the morning? What, what is what is exciting to you about the work that you do? What I love about my job is that I get to do lots of different things in a single day. So no day is normal. I, you know, I couldn't give you a typical day, really. But I'll, I'll explain what I'm doing today, because I think today it's, it's just as typical as any other day. So this morning I taught in the classroom. I taught immigration law, um, had no fieldwork component at all. This is purely a class that um, that is taught. Um, after I talk to you, I'm going to have a series of meetings with my students uh, who are all working on different matters with representing different clients. And we have team meetings once a week. And in those meetings, we talk through what's happening. We develop a plan. I give them feedback. And after that, then I have a client meeting. We're meeting a client to, to go over a declaration that they've written uh, in order to file an asylum claim on, on their behalf. So that's that's sort of the, the conclusion of my public facing duties. And then I also am in the process of, of writing a book. So when I have time in the day between meetings or, you know, if I have half a day where I don't happen to have meetings, I'm, I'm writing um, and, uh, and do quite a bit of writing, actually, whether it's academic articles, this book or, you know, book chapters, that sort of thing. So, again, the, the combination of the teaching and the practice and, um, and the sort of scholarship aspect of it in a typical day, I, I, I will do all three of those things. Well, yeah, that certainly certainly sounds like there's a lot of variety um, and a lot of really cool work. You know, <laughs> one thing that we're asking people is, uh, what are some of the not so fun parts of, of your job? Like, I mean, what are the the parts that are taxing to you or difficult or, uh, yeah, that you might just, you know, not particularly enjoy? Well, I guess I would say that the advantages of my job can also become disadvantages, mm -hmm. which is to say that. I have so many different things going on and it's very hard to balance everything appropriately. So when you're, when you're representing clients, that has to be your top priority because uh, you have a fiduciary duty towards your clients to, to zealously represent them. At the same time, I've been hired by the University of Chicago to teach law students. So in some ways, that has to be my top priority because the law student experience and the, the learning that the law students do in the clinic is essential to my role. And then at the same time, I know that if I don't focus on scholarship ever, um, then I will feel like I have cheated myself because I do feel like in addition to it being very important on its own terms, the scholarship actually improves my teaching and the teaching improves my scholarship. It's very important to me. But as you might expect, when you're looking at you know, writing a, a, a law review article, it's often hard to balance that with things that are more urgent, uh, you know, or cases and, and legal representations where you you're sort of at the mercy of other parties like the court or opposing counsel. So um, I would say that I love every aspect of my job. But often they all of the different aspects of my job conflict in a way that makes it more stressful than I wish it it would be sometimes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
So we've heard a lot about uh, your experiences, but uh, I'm curious, you know, who are some of the the characters in this story? Who, who are a few of the people who have, uh, you know, really supported you um, in, in any capacity uh, over the course of your career? I've, I've had so much support at every single stage. And, you know, one thing that I, I tell my students now, um, and and I even tell this to high school students who who contact me for advice and college students, the, the one of the most important things you can do is you can you can really focus on um, getting good mentors who care about you. Um, almost everything that has ever happened that I've considered a good thing in my career has been almost directly because of the support of mentors. I have a college professor. Her name's Andrea Sununu. She teaches um, you know early um, uh, modern. Uh, British literature. So it's not something that I do currently um, really in my in, in my job at this point. But I credit her with teaching me how to write. When she when she would review my my papers at college, she would she would do meetings with us after every draft and she would read the papers out loud to us and then comment on each sentence afterwards on how to make it better. And that was an extremely painful thing to have to go through. If you've ever had somebody read your college term paper back to you, um, you, you might imagine how how painful that yeah. is. But I learned to write in a way that I never would have otherwise. And I really credit her with, with teaching me that. I have a couple of mentors from law school that have just been essential in getting me where I am today, uh, including my clinical professor, Michael Wishney, who uh, I basically think I've um, I've learned almost everything um, that I know from him, um, and 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 he's been extremely supportive. I guess I would also say that you know, in addition to my professional mentors, there are just certain people in my life, my personal life, that have been essential to my success. You know, my parents have always been very supportive of me. Um, and, and so I, I don't think I would be where I am without them. And then the other person I wanted to mention is my husband. We've been together for 15 years at this point, and he has always been so supportive of my career. I, I could not have done it without him. We have two children, um, ages nine and five, and it is extremely difficult, as you might imagine, to balance being a a parent and having a career that that takes um, a lot out of you. And I would not be able to do it without him. He's an equal partner in everything that we do. So, but not only that, he has been, he, he has allowed me to take risks and take jobs that I would not have been able to take if he wasn't supportive. Before I took this job at the University of Chicago, I was at the University of Buffalo and and I got this position and I and I really wanted to move. And it was not the best career move for him. He had to sacrifice mm -hmm. in order to to allow me to take it, but he did. And so if, if you're a young person listening to this, picking your your life partner is one of the most important decisions you will ever make. And you have to pick someone who is going to be supportive if you if you have career aspirations that are going to be difficult to uh, to reach, you really need to make sure that you have a partner that's supportive. And I've been really lucky that I do. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I wanted to make sure to ask, uh, what is the most gratifying thing that you do in your field? Like what 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 keeps you coming back to this work? Well, I, you know, I, I, there's so much that's that's gratifying. I'm going to give you two things. I can't I can't narrow it down to one. OK, so the, the first is that um, I often am working on cases for years um, because it takes a very long time to win an immigration case in the United mm -hmm. States. And it's it's a lot of hard work and it's a slog and there are many late nights and you can start to feel like, you know, you're doing all this work and you're not seeing any results and it can be really frustrating. But when you win a case and you look your client in the eye and they're able to stay with their family in the United States, because of what you did, that is so gratifying. And even if it only happens every once in a while, because it's so difficult to win these cases, it makes all of the hard work worth it. And then the second thing I would say is when a student contacts me after graduation and tells me about the successes, the professional successes that they've had, and then tells me that it's at least in part because of the support and mentorship that I gave them, 
that also is immensely gratifying because again, I see my role as amplifying the work that I do. And so when I see a student doing good work and being successful in their career, I consider that a an enormous success. Yeah, um, well, that's really cool. And um, on a personal note, thank you for the work that you do. This this sounds like such an amazing clinic, and and sounds like you guys are doing great things. Um, I uh, yeah, I just w- wanted to wrap up uh, with a, a question uh, about you know what what advice you would give to anyone who might be listening. And you mentioned some earlier, but um, you know, for people who are considering entering your field, uh, what are a few things that you would want them to know? Well, I think. One of the things I would want them to know is uh, that law school is a kind of unique experience that if you're not prepared for it, it can really derail you from the goals that you have, your professional goals. And what I mean by that is that there are many, many law students who who, who come into law school um, wanting to uh, go into academia or do public interest work. Um, they aren't interested in going and working at corporate law firms, but somehow after three years of law school, they, that's what they end mm-hmm. up doing. The, the incentives to go into the private sector are are very high. You know, you there's there are the high salaries. You you get recruited very heavily in law school, and I see a lot of students who follow down a different path than they wanted to when they entered law school, and you know, some of them end up being happy with it, but I think other people feel like you know, they kind of got off track um, and they end up not with the career that they want, but the kind of career that that they ended up with because that was sort of what everyone else was doing in law school. So what I would say to to people in college and, and high school who are considering law school, if you have a reason that you're going to law school and it's not that you want to get a job at a corporate firm, you're going to have to really... Um, Find ways to stay the course in law school so that you don't get derailed while you're in law school. It is possible. I, I tell students anyone can have a rewarding, creative um, career in law. Uh, and you don't all have to do the same thing. We don't all have to go work at a corporate law firm. So it's 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 difficult to uh, stay the course often, but it's I can say, having come out the other side, that it's extremely rewarding. And if you can get through those three years, then you should be okay and you can have the career that you want. One thing that I, I that helps people who are in law school is to find peers who are kind of taking the same path and again, to find mentors. And if you were in law school or considering going to law school, your clinical professors are likely to be a good resource for you because many of them um, have taken different paths than corporate lawyers. And many of them are not, have never been corporate lawyers. And that will give you some idea about how you can have the job that you want. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm, you know, it's, it's great to hear about how all this has worked out. It's really cool to hear about your work. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for coming and sharing all this today. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. See you around.